Warm welcome to Gideon Prime this Wednesday, the 29th of May 2013. It is the day when the bid by members of parliament to grant themselves a pay hike was dealt a big blow as the president intervened, calling on the legislators to respect the constitution. Well, this means the MPs wait for the fatter check continues. This is our main story tonight, but first, the highlights. No act can supersede the provisions of the Constitution. I think it's well spelled out in the Constitution. No smiling to the bank yet. Rude shock for greedy MPs. The decision by Botswana to offer a different suggestion to what the AU came up with was not intended at hurting the relations with Kenya. It wasn't even focused on the leadership of Kenya. Against the grain, why Botswana opposed AU stand on ICC? Cost of MPs greed, why Kenyans are shunning the swines? And return to Somalia, life after war on perspective. Right, many thanks for joining us. President Uhuru Kenyatta has told members of parliament to follow the law and take the salary determined by the Salaries Commission. Uhuru says the Salaries and Remuneration Commission is the only body mandated by law to set salary scales for all state officers, including MPs. And as KTN's Rita Tinina reports, the president fired the salvo as the Commission on the Implementation of the Constitution announced it would institute legal proceedings against any officer who approves payment to MPs outside the set limits. Members of parliament may have been unanimous in their resolve to revoke a gazette notice that reduced their salaries, but it is not a done deal yet. It's not going to stop us from doing our job. The SRC maintains the constitution vests in it the sole mandate to set and review salaries and benefits of state officers. And on that one, it has the backing of the president. In a statement, President Uru Kenyatta says while acknowledging the independence of parliament, the constitution explicitly mandates the SRC to set and review the salaries of all state officers. The constitution is supreme. And therefore... No act can supersede the provisions of the Constitution. The action of the National Assembly to revoke the said Gazette notices is of no legal effect or consequence. The Commission on the Implementation of the Constitution argues that MPs broke the law when they voted to revoke the Gazette notice by the SRC. The express provision of Article 122, sub Article 3 of the Constitution was not respected. That article provides that a member shall not vote on any question in which the member has a pecuniary interest. The SRC and the CIC argue that anyone who effects new salaries for MPs other than what was set by the SRC will be breaking the law. And faces the risk of being held liable for abuse of office and aiding in the misuse of public funds and should be declared not eligible to hold public office. The CIC has now written to the Parliamentary Service Commission, the Cabinet Secretary for the National Treasury, the Controller of Budget, and the Attorney General over the MP's pay controversy. The CIC says it will not only institute legal proceedings in court against officers who approve MP's salaries. Any money is paid as remuneration or a benefit to a state officer, other than in accordance with the terms set by SRC, will be recoverable from such state officer. In with the MP's salaries round now down to constitutional interpretation, the SRC, it appears, has the law on its side. And MPs may not be smiling all the way to the bank just yet. Vita Tinina, KTN, Nairobi. Rita Tinina, thank you so much for that. The president has spoken. It has been a war of words. The MPs are adamant. Uhuru Kenyatta telling the MPs to follow the law. That is the topic of our big question tonight. We are asking you, do you support President Kenyatta's stand on MP salaries? Do you support President Kenyatta's stand on salaried salaries? Let us know what you think about that. Of course, send your yes or no response with a brief comment to the number 8040. We will sample your views at the tail end of this newscast. Of course, you need to stay on for that. We 
we'd love to hear what you think about that story. Now, from the battle for pay hike to the battle for supremacy, and the last few weeks have seen MPs and senators engage in an exchange over superiority in Parliament. At the centre of this row is control over legislation relating to funds for the county members of the National Assembly. I've taken a break, but as KTN's Aaron Ochiang reports, the battle could resume with far-reaching effects on affecting the devolved system of government. Who exactly should be recognized as playing a more critical role in the legislative process? Is it a member of the National Assembly or a senator? This is a debate that has been witnessed in both chambers of the houses in the last few days. The supremacy battle between the National Assembly and the Senate is unlikely to end anytime soon as members of the two houses continue to charge at each other. Whereas MPs insist that the National Assembly is supreme, being the supreme legislative organ, senators insist that a quick check across the world shows that the Senate is always the upper house of parliament and superior to the National Assembly. Look at this, the, the, the joint sitting of the two houses. It's the Speaker of the National Assembly who chairs. Look at the Parliamentary Service Commission. The chair is the Speaker of the National Assembly. Go even to the worst case scenario, God forbid, that we, ha we don't have a president or a deputy president. It is the Speaker of the National Assembly who becomes the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. It would appear that the drafters of the Constitution did not anticipate an exchange of this nature between the two houses and, consequently, did not give express provisions on the matter. The Senate was created to represent the counties and serve to protect the interests of county governments. Article 96 of the Constitution reads in part, the Senate represents the counties and serves to protect the interests of the counties and other governments. It goes further to say the Senate participates in the law-making function of Parliament by considering, debating and approving bills concerning counties. I wouldn't want to say that is a, is a retirement or a resting house they, they have, the other side, they have, they have a duty. And indeed they have sworn into this child the same duty. The duty that we have been given by the, uh, the, the, the common citizen is to register it. And exactly that's what the two houses they are doing. Therefore, the business of a upper and the lower house, the, the constitution does not provide. And Article 95 of the Constitution states the National Assembly shall deliberate on and resolve issues of concern to the people, enact legislation, determine the allocation of national revenue and appropriate funds for expenditure by the national government and other national state organs. It goes further to give the National Assembly an oversight role over the national revenue and its expenditure. A critical issue now is we stop the side shows, senators play their role as per the constitution, members of parliament play their role as per the constitution, the national government, the president plays his role, and the governors play their role. The common denominator is service delivery to the people of Kenya. Both MPs and senators have been exchanging harsh words on which house is superior to the other. The exchanges could resume once members of the National Assembly return from their break in five days. Aaron Oshen, KTN. Let's now focus our attention on the African Union. It might be Africa's renegade nation, but tiny South African state of Botswana is not apologetic for rejecting the African Union resolution to terminate ICC cases in the region. The only dissident in the continent, Botswana, says the AU has got it wrong and its latest affront against the ICC may not yield much. In an exclusive interview with KTN Samogina, Botswana's ambassador to Kenya, John Moretti, says African Union is playing politics with a judicial process. On the verge of petitioning the United Nations Security Council an anti-ICC resolution laced with threats of African nations withdrawing from the Rome Statute, the single but bold dissenting nation to the AU Heads of State Summit Resolution, Botswana, says the continental body stance is rather political than pragmatic. The decision by Botswana to offer a different suggestion to what the AU came up with was not intended at hurting the relations with Kenya. 
it wasn't even focused on the leadership of Kenya. Uh, it was focused on sort of making the AU appreciate that it is important to build more bridges of understanding with the international community rather than pull Africa away from its international obligations. The South African tiny nation says out of the 53 nations that rubber stamped the referral or termination motion of the ICC cases, merely half are state parties to the Rome Statute that domesticated the ICC. And that arithmetic may just be AU's main undoing. The approach should have been maybe mandate members of the ICC within the African Union to go and pursue the case at the conference of parties of the ICC. Maybe that would have been the best approach. AU is uh, independent and they have a right to lobby uh, the way they want to lobby. Um, I don't think that um, there's anything that is wrong with that at all. Botswana quips the AU resolution may antagonize the court rather than help its cause and that marshalling African nations to withdraw from their own statute if its wishes are vetoed is retrogressive and undermines the championing of peace and stability of African democracies. Those who have been unhappy with the conduct of the prosecutor are not necessarily unhappy with the court because they overwhelmingly supported the formation, the Rome Statute, which established the court. So I don't think there's a problem with the court. Despite being overshadowed by the majority vote at the AU summit, Botswana paints a portrait of a country steadfast to respect its international obligations and as such says that only African nations, state parties to the Rome Statute that has domesticated the ICC, may petition the UN Security Council to trigger any sort of action. Samogina Ketian, Nairobi. Uh, let's stay with that story. In the last couple of hours, the ICC has also issued a statement on the proposed termination, saying that the court does not seek to interfere with the national jurisdiction of any signatory, but only complements it under the Rome Statute, while the United Nations Security Council has the power of referrals and deferrals in relation to the ICC, insisting that the international court is independent. Let's see how this goes. Of course, in the coming days, we'll keep an eye on it for you. Elsewhere, Bungoma OCPD Emos Cheboy is among 10 senior police officers who have been transferred in a reshuffle announced by Inspector General of Police David Kimayo. Cheboy has been moved to police headquarters and will be replaced by the Nyeri OCPD Kirinya Limbetu. The changes are geared towards improving the state of security in the country, which has been deteriorating in some parts. Police forces from Vihiga, Lugari and Teso North have also been moved. The changes come a day after the National Police Service Commission Chair Johnson Kavuludi alleged that the office of the Inspector General was opposed to the recruitment of senior police officers as county commanders. Well, at least 92 pending appeals lodged by capital offenders at committee maximum prison will be heard and dispensed within the next two months. Chief Justice William Tunga gave inmates this assurance when he visited the maximum security facility earlier today. Well, his visit comes barely a month after inmates at the prison went on a hunger strike, protesting delays in the determination of the appeals. Wilkis Tanyabwa reports. In mid-April, over 500 inmates at Committee Maximum Security Prison went on a hunger strike, protesting the delays in the hearing of their appeals. The inmates sought an audience with the Chief Justice, and today a delegation led by the Chief Justice, William Mutunga, arrived at Committee to listen to their grievances. You know, kama wanaume hawa wote, waneza sema, lewa tutakula. We are not going to take any food. We are going to wait for the Chief Justice. And ya kuze. How are you going to get the money? When you say that in 2009, you can get the money from 2009. You can get the money from 2009. Uh, Inmates also raise concerns about being remanded for longer periods than the maximum sentences for their offenses as they waited for their day in court. But the judiciary asserts that it has set the ball rolling. Starting 3rd June, it will be handling 92 appeals lodged by capital offenders, inmates who have committed crimes that attract the death penalty. The judiciary intends to dispense with 92 cases by the end of July. This would leave over 2,000 cases that are still pending in high courts across the country. 
kwenye uh, prisons uh, tuangalie wale wamekaa hapo kwa muda mrefu ili kesi zao zisikizwe upesi tunajua tulikosa lakini jo sikaanakishwa tu <coughs> The move could decongest a prison that was built for 1,400 prisoners but now holds over 3,000 inmates, sending the lucky few inmates home. Wilkes Anyabwa, KTN. You're watching KTN Prime. Thank you so much for staying with us all this far. Let's give you a preview of what you can expect right after this bulletin. It's very interesting. On tonight's edition of our weekly show, Perspective, we follow the story of two young Somali men from London as they make an intrepid journey back to their homeland, Somalia. The two energetic men are out to eradicate anti-tribal discrimination in Somalia and across the world. What challenges will they face? How will they cope with the precarious security situation in Mogadishu, here's a sneak preview of what to expect. Some people say Somali is a failed state. It hurts me, so, to be honest, it hurts me deep down in my heart. Adam and Abdi are two of the nine million ethnic Somalis living outside of Somalia. It's not London. You have to adapt to what Mufti is doing. You don't look like Mufti people, but we Somali, no matter about which passport we have, yeah, and we come here to help Somali people. I'm sure everyone is interested in rebuilding Somalia. Join John Alanamu immediately after this bulletin for perspective. And of course, you will find out the ways in which you can be part of that program. Now, to a big question reminder, and tonight we're asking you if you support President Kenyatta's stand on MP salaries. Of course, President Uhuru Kenyatta told members of parliament to observe the law. Send your yes or no response with a brief comment to the number 8040. And we will sample some of your views at the tail end of this bulletin. Thank you so much for staying with KTN. We are taking a short break and just ahead. Cost of MPs greed why Kenyans are shunning the swine. and losses. When activist Boniface Mwangi unleashed his bloody pig protest against MP's quest for higher pay, he was faced with dissenting voices from all quarters. <coughs> Animal rights activists were poked the wrong way by the incident. Muslim associations said the protesters should have used other ways to beef up their message. And Kenyans online, let's just say they didn't chicken out of joining in the debate. Now, more than two weeks later, and the pig deal, well, it's still a big deal. Meet the Kenyan National Pig Farmers Association who say the whole affair has dented their piggy bank. Processors are complaining that they are not able to sell as much as they used to sell. I don't want to particularly quote one, but uh, if you want, I will. But Boniface Mwangi seems to be receiving support from the most unlikely source. The Boston Globe defends his extreme method, citing it was necessary due to the low turnout in the protests. Back home, however, Boniface has been accused of using the protests to bring home his bacon. The pig is the one, the, the, one of the cleanest animals I know of. The pig is not dirty. You, the keeper, you are the one who is dirty. <laughs> But as the grunting and the squealing over the pokey affair continues, the pig farmers need not worry about their piggy banks anymore as the MPs clamor for more packs was dealt a big blow with the president's directive that the salaries and remuneration commission's decision when it comes to public state officers' pay is final. Asham Wilu, KTN.
Good evening and thank you for keeping it KTN. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. Let's do business. A section of parliament is accusing the National Treasury for delaying the process of scrutinizing the budget. This is in addition to confusion within the House over the time frame in which the budget estimates are supposed to be looked at and adopted by parliament. Adelaide Chungole kicks off tonight's business. It was a process set out to work like clockwork, but it has been anything but smooth sailing for the budget making process. We were disorganized by the election and we were subsequently disorganized by the statement that we saw in parliament for over one month. It was not necessary in my view. I think we should have done much better. Uh, right now it has eaten into the time that we would have had for public to give meaningful and reasonable uh, contribution to this budget. The problems have ranged from delaying the submission of estimates and revenue outlines from Treasury to a hold up occasion by a standoff in Parliament, all of which ate into the time supposed to have catered for public participation. And now Treasury is facing new charges of frustrating the process further by failing to give the legislature an itemized expenditure plan for the estimates submitted. The Treasury has blocked anyone from accessing the itemized, itemized budget estimate. Parliament says the action by Treasury could jeopardize public hearing schedules to start Thursday and run through June 4th. If we fail to get the estimated budget item by item by today evening, Kenyans are not going to have public hearing and to approve the budget. With less than two weeks to work on the budget, the complaints by parliamentarians are a clear indicator that a process that is already lagging behind schedule could lag even further behind if not well played by those involved. Adelaide Changole, KTN Business Today. Kenya Med Commission has suspended its managing commissioner Ibrahim Isak Haji to allow investigations on financial mismanagement in the company. Three other top managers have also resigned with the board of directors saying they too will be investigated. The move came just days after the Agriculture and Livestock Cabinet Secretary Felix Kuzge toured the company and ordered it to pay farmers their date arrears. The three are Deputy Commissioner and Finance Manager Patrick Mutemi, Irene Mbiti, legal affairs and Evans Bikunda chief accountant Haji who was appointed end year 2011 has been suspended for three months pending investigations last week the managing commissioner said KMC was facing financial problems due to the 2009 drought which met the commission by emaciated beef animals And oil exploration firm Tala Oil paid the government of Kenya 618 million shillings in taxes and other fees for the financial year 2012 for its operations locally. In a statement on its spending and operations, the firm noted that it had paid 538 million Kenya shillings in taxes while a further 80.7 million shillings was paid in other fees required by the state during the period and a review. However, the company which already in active play in northern parts of the country did not remit any corporate taxes since it is yet to make any gains from the exploration across the borders in uganda where talo also has operations the firm paid 14.8 billion shillings for taxes including 12 billion shillings in corporate taxes talo oil has already indicated that its oil fines in kenya are substantial and commercial production could start in a period of between five to seven years Earlier in the year, the Kenya, the Kenya government had said in its letter of intent to the IMF that it was reviewing tax on natural resources, noting that it was about to become a major producer of oil. Well, it's time for us to look at sports. 
It was more of a procession back to office as Kipchoge Keino and his National Olympic Committee incumbents retained their seats during the polls held in a city hotel today. Athletics Kenya Chairman Isaiah Kiplagat was one of the casualties after failing to clinch the first vice chairman's position. Football Kenya Federation Chairman Sam Nyamwea withdrew from the race after alleging that the process was not fair and discriminatory. We have more. Some of us who are candidates were surprised that the same same exact officials who are candidates are the ones who are receiving our nomination papers, are the ones who are saying this, uh, who, are, who are bringing what we call the, the programs. These are the acrimonious moments that characterized the National Olympics Committee of Kenya on Wednesday. A section of members took issue with the election process. Nyamoya walked out of the hall but did not receive support from other federations. It was only the Taekwondo Federation that was barred from the polls as they had internal leadership wrangles. However, when the process began, there was a clear trend with their office bearers carrying the day. Kipchoge Ghana 21 votes against Kangati is 10. We want independent audit, forensic audit of accounts of NOC. <laughs> David Okea stepped down for his AK chairman Isaac Plagat, who was vying for the first vice chairman but who lost to swimming federation chairman Ben Ekumbo. Ekumbo polled 24 votes against Kiplagat's four. Lifting federation's Pius Ocheng was an opposer to the second vice chair after the withdrawal of Sam Nyamoya. Francis Paul was an opposer to the secretary general while Frida Shiroya defeated journalist Elena Shiveka to retain the treasurer's post. Other winners were Paul Rawal for women's representative, while former marathon record holder Paul Tergat floored swimmer Jason Dunford for the post of men's athletics representative. Former long-distance greats Tegla Lorupe and Catherine Dereba will sit in the executive committee together James Chacha, Stephen Arabsoy, Anne Jambi and hockey chairman Risham Baines. For the first time, athletics can not have a representative in the committee. personally feel that we need a representative from the athletics. We need also a representative from the football, but we cannot dictate and we cannot uh, uh, pressurize or bring somebody Let the people elect the person they want. There's a feeling by a section of members that change was needed at NOC. We need some level of constitutional change to bring sanity to the programs. If you look at uh, NOC as it is right now, Yes, Kenya is doing well in terms of athletics, but at athletics only is what you're talking about. And athletics, can you really attribute it to NOC? The incoming officers will be in office for four years. Reporting for KTN Sports today, I'm Hassan Juma. Harambe Stars camp is expected to be full house by Friday latest, even as the Stars shifted camp to the quiet enclosure of the Old Trafford Stadium in Ivasha, the home of a Syrian football club. The Stars, we, who have been training at the City Stadium, left for Ivasha this afternoon where they will be shaping for next Wednesday's World Cup return leg qualifier against African champions, the Super Eagles of Nigeria. Wimbledon FC player uh, that is Curtis Osano is expected in the country tomorrow and will head straight to Naivasha to link up with his colleagues. Brian Gateri, Arnold Origin and Jamal Mohammed will be the last group to arrive on Friday. Origin and Captain Dennis Oliech will not be able, uh, will not be available for Wednesday's match but will be during the match against Malawi on June 12th. Kenya held Nigeria to a one all draw in the first leg last month and is hoping to better that result at home.